Hello and welcome and thank you for joining me again as we continue in our look at 1 Peter chapter 3. And I've been kind of uh, circling around verse 18 for the last you know couple of days. In fact, we ended last week by looking at the same verse. And I, I want to say just a few more things because I think this is uh, something that matters to most of us. We all have a real concern about what happens after we die. And I know that uh, I'm reminded of something Walter Payton, the football great uh, running back for the Chicago Bears, when he was uh, dying of cancer, a reporter asked him if he was afraid to die. And his answer was, of course I am. I've never done it before. And I think that sometimes as Christians, we're literally a little reticent to admit the fact that we're afraid of death. And uh, because it's something that we've never experienced and we're trusting in the faithfulness and the truthfulness of God's word uh, to give us the assurance that when we leave this body that we will go to be with the pres in the presence of the Lord. Something I think, though, that can kind of be helpful is you realize, uh, especially as you age, that you are not your body. I mean, I, I can look at pictures of myself when I was a just a small child, and I'm not that person anymore. In fact, I sometimes forget until I look at a picture of myself 20 years ago, and I was a lot more spry and vital and, and had more energy and uh, rest link, re less wrinkles and, and less, uh, I didn't have these, these jowls and the bags under my eyes and all these sort of things. These are all the things that I have earned by living this long. And so when you begin to see that deterioration of your physical capacities, your mental capacities, you just your loss of strength and other things of that nature, and your vulnerability to other age-related uh, maladies, one of the things you recognize is that inside you feel the same. This was my father's words to me when he was dying. He said that on the inside, I feel like a young man, but my body will not do anything I tell it. And I could understand that because I feel that same way at this point in my life, that I feel just as young inside as I did when I was 20 or 30 or 40 or even 50 years ago. But my body is the thing that's beginning to put limitations on what I can do and how well I can do those things. And that's something that if you don't have the hope of eternal life, then you sit there and just live with regrets. In fact, our culture today is so obsessed with not growing old and not dying that people are spending a fortune, much of it thrown away needlessly, on foods and supplements and diets and exercises and surgeries and injections and on and on it goes because we're desperately trying to push death as far into the background of our lives as we possibly can. And in fact, I've had people tell me that they hate it whenever I talk about death and the end of life because it makes them feel so uncomfortable because they're terrified by the thought. And yet for the Christian, this is supposed to be the great hope of our calling that what I'm looking forward to is not to remain forever bound in this decaying body. Can you imagine living to be 900 years old like Adam did and having to live in this depreciating, decaying body. Man, talking about having uh, wrinkles. But the whole point is that we, as we get older, we actually begin to hope more and more in the end of this life and in the coming of the second. And one of the things that has terrorized a lot of people I've talked to who are uh, near the end of their life is that they'll be cut off and separated from their loved ones. And I shared yesterday about how that I don't believe that's what happens. I believe that because we enter into eternity, which is a, a timeless reality, it's not measured by ticks on the clock, that that moment you enter eternally, you're going to awaken with all of your loved ones and friends there with you. And so there's going to be no sense of separation or anything of that nature. There'll just be celebration. Celebration unending, because that will be the nature of eternity for those who know Christ. But also keep in mind, for those who don't know Christ, they also go into an unending eternal reality, and that's going to be eternal darkness. Uh, I almost kind of sense that somehow those people are going to know and he may be even able to see what they don't have, as is illustrated in Jesus' story about Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man seeing Lazarus being comforted and cared for, himself being cut off from all comfort and care. 
And I think that would be doubly the torment to those souls who are eternally separated from God. I know there are people who teach that eternity is not eternal, uh, but it's, it really becomes a nonsense when you talk about that there's annihilation or you cease to exist or and things of that nature. That I'm not first doesn't understand the nature of spirit. Spiritual does not get to decay. So your soul is a spiritual essence. It doesn't decay. It doesn't change. It doesn't grow old and it doesn't cease to exist. That's just the nature of soul. But secondly, it is not subject to a, a, a world of time. It's an eternal dimension that we enter to, into in death, and who we are when we enter eternity is who we will be for all of eternity, which really kind of weighs heavy on me sometimes when I think about people who do not know Jesus, that even people who I basically really dislike and don't have, have very low opinions of them, at the same time, then I'm I'm checked in my heart because I think, but what's going to happen if they die without Christ? And so I've started praying for even people that I think are doing more harm in this world than good, because I know that what they're going to experience is going to exceed any kind of penalty I can ever imagine upon them. If you say that I wish somebody would go to hell, then you don't understand what hell is. You don't have even the faintest concept of how horrific it is. And so I think it's one of those things why it puts it becomes incumbent upon us as followers of Christ that we would pray because Jesus so loved this world, everybody in it, that he was willing to die and become the recipient of my sins and my trespasses in order that I might escape that eternal perishing. And we use the word perishing, which is a time-sensitive word, but the, the perishing of eternity is endless perishing where the worm never dies, it says. Where, In other words, the decay process just continues unendingly. And so if we know that there are people who are not going to make it to heaven, we should be praying every time we think about them, Lord, please save the soul. Send somebody to reach them. Bring them to an awareness, Lord. Let your Holy Spirit so press in upon their heart that they would just cry out for mercy. Because that's the only way I got saved. That's the only way you got saved. We came to that point where the darkness within was so daunting and so, so desperately painful that we were willing to say, Lord Jesus, save me. Come into my life. Deliver me from this body of death. And Christ did. He came into your life and he transformed your life. And I know that you have your issues. You've got your problems, your shortcomings. And that will never go away as long as you're carting around this old carcass called your body. But one day, the hope of the believer is we get separated from that carcass and we go home to him and he gives us a new one. And uh, what that lo works looks like and how that happens, I can't say with certainty, but I just say that the corruption is put off and we take on incorruption. The temporary is put off and we take on the eternal, the everlasting. It's, we, we die like Adam and we're raised like the new Adam. Just as Christ was raised with a new body, that even though it had the marks of death in his hands and his side and his feet, yet nonetheless, he was alive by the Holy Spirit. And that's what God's promised to do. He's going to resurrect our body and give us that new body that's going to be like unto his own. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul put it, we will see him as he is, for we shall be like him. It's an incomprehensible but wonderful promise that just thrills my soul when I think about it, especially when I begin to feel the, the maladies of growing older and the pains and difficulties. Or for some of you who are going through really the, the horribly difficult treatments that uh, come with addressing disease in your body and all the side effects and everything else. You know, the weariness that you go through. I'm just saying, friend, it's temporary. And one day, before you know it, you'll be freed from it. And you will, as your spirit and soul leave this body, you're not going to want to come back. You're just going to want to keep on going. And I just know that when you get into the presence of the Lord, you're going to find yourself in the eternal present. And you're going to see all these people gather to greet you. And you know who those people are? Everybody you loved and knew here on earth. And they may not even be dead in terms of time, but I believe that they're present with you in eternity. And so this is the, the, the celebration, the wondrous uh, uh, reunion in heaven where I often pray as I pray for family members, Lord, don't let the circle be unbroken. Let all of these loved ones and family members, uh, frankly, some of them I don't particularly enjoy, 
But nonetheless, I don't want them to miss out on heaven because I know when they get to heaven, whatever personality defects they have will be gone. And which is probably is true of me as well. My personality effects will be gone as well. And please don't say amen. But nonetheless, it's the truth. And then we'll be together. And that's why I think sometimes the struggles and the conflicts and the bitterness, the resentments that we have in this world are so incredibly petty because they're part of this temporary broken world. They're not part of the eternal. Well, I spent quite a bit of time on verse 18. I think tomorrow I'll launch into a whole new adventure, which is not an easy one. Read ahead, verses 19 and 20. You'll see what I'm talking about. God bless you. Go in His grace.